Durst, Mr. Durst is present with Mr. DeGarren and Mr. Chesnoff, Mr. Lewin Miata, Henderson, Milius, Bailey, and the whole, whole team. Let's see, somebody's missing. Mr. Ray, Mr. Lewis, they're somewhere. All right. <clears throat> you may resume the cross examination. Oh, it's not cross, really, is it? <laughs> it feels like cross. <laughs> it feels like cross, but Friday, it's not. Friday, Friday. That's your, I know that's your point. Okay, anyway, um, your direct examination yeah. of, the, uh, of the witness. And, Your Honor, I just want to make sure the jury understands that I asked for permission I, yeah. to remove my jacket. No, I gave you, uh, gave you uh, permission and counsel if you want. <clears throat> Seems like, yeah, you can remove your jacket, I suppose. It seems like those. Thank you. As long as he doesn't take anything else off. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that was referring to him. That's <laughs> good. You make it to All right. you. Ma'am, you, you just heard that clip, is that correct? Yes. Um, would you agree that was Mr. Durr saying to you in September of 2016 that he wanted to give you whatever money you wanted? Yes. This is after he had already given you at least 338000 which you'd only paid back 2000 correct? Yes. And, ma'am, you were confronted with this exact clip when you testified on February 15, 2017. Do you recall that? I don't, I don't remember, but. Your attorney asked for, you have a copy, a transcript of your testimony, is that correct? Yes. Did you read it? Uh, yes. Do you remember in reading it, do you remember that I asked you about the same clip <laughs> four years ago? Do you yeah. remember that or no? Yes. I. I believe so. And, and so when you said a moment ago that you didn't recall that Mr. Durst was making arrangements to pay you additional monies while he was in custody, does this refresh your memory now? Um, yes. But is it your testimony that before you read that, you did not remember that you would have repeated conversations with Mr. Durst about money since uh, his arrest? Yes. All right, during that same call, ma'am, did you recall were discussions made about him paying your son's tuition? Yes, it, but he was on scholarship for that school. So yes, but I do remember. What, do you recall Mr. Durst mentioning that he had been brought a bunch of checks to sign from his lawyer and that one of them was for the tuition? Oh, honestly, I didn't see the check for tuition. I don't. I'm going to play um, uh, clip number. This is going to be uh, SG072, September 8, 2016 call. Mr. Milius. property that you wanted to develop 
Yes. With Mr. Durst for him to pay for and the two of you to live in. Is that right? Yes. The check was my check. That's why I would just bought it. Okay. And, and ma'am, the when it says Chris Christie, Governor Christie was you meant Chris Garcia, is that correct? Yes. Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, was not paying your bills, correct? No, unfortunately, no. Don't, don't he had his be, own problems. Don't be so sure, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on January 4th of 2017, a month before your conditional examination uh, testimony, did you have a conversation with Mr. Durst where he told you that he was going to support you and pay off all of your debts? Yes. Did he also mention to you, do you recall a concern that he had about what might happen if he paid off those debts? No. Uh, Code SG086, people's next in order. And your honor, may this be marked as 209 and 209A? Yes. No agreement and that I can support you, I can pay off your debts. I was concerned last time we spoke, they were upset because you had done something. That's not the case at all. But their concern is that Lloyd will try to charge you do you recall that now, Mr. Durst, pointing out to you that uh, his lawyers had approved that he was going to be able to pay your debts? I mean, it's there. He said it. I unfortunately don't remember. I well, don't. I well, ma'am, that was 2017, January. You would agree that since then, many of your bills and debts have been paid by Mr. Durst, correct? Since, no, not since, no. So I, I have not received, no. Okay. He told me to come, honestly, you could see in the tapes, he asked me how much I was in debt and I never came back with a number for him. Okay, let me continue, ma'am. Um, as of January 17th, again, this is less than a month before your testimony, were you discussing with Mr. Durst the arrangements for you to receive money uh, from his lawyers? No, I, I just said I, I have not received right. any checks. I... SG073, this is January 11, 2017. People in order, Mr. Milius. Huh? 78. 78, yes. Uh, Yes. Did you speak to Chuck Lewis? I did. I did. Um, you're you're going to get two letters from me. One letter you're going to disregard because he did call me. So he did. Very nice man. Um, and we'll work something out. So he, he did reach out to me and. Ma'am, so it was your understanding, correct, that you were going to be getting money from Mr. Durst's representatives. Mr. Durst, you were expecting more money to be coming, correct? I'm, I'm going to... Yes. I... Yes. Okay. Ma'am, at that point, you were aware that you were going to be testifying in this case. You knew that you were going to be either called as a witness by the prosecution or potentially as a witness for the defense, correct? Yes. Did you see any issue, ma'am, with your objectivity, with 
receiving money from Mr. Durst when you knew that you were going to be testifying in court, potentially as his witness? Yes, so that's why I never told him how much I would have needed to make sure that I told him at some other point, some other time. I just... Ma'am? I, I didn't get a check. That's how it ended. Ma'am, at any point, did you tell Bob Durst, don't send me money? No, I just kept telling him we'll talk. Right. So, ma'am, so what you're saying is, is you were aware that it looked bad for you to be receiving money from him. So you didn't name an exact number, but you continued to discuss that you would eventually get substantial monies from him, right? It wasn't one of our top conversations when we spoke. I. I so, ma'am, it's, it's your position that you asking for money or mentioning your money problems to Mr. Durst was not a main part of the conversations you had with Mr. Durst for six years? Well, he would ask me how I was doing, and I would be honest with him. Um, it wasn't like I was trying to go on vacation or take advantage. You're, you're making it sound like at all. It's not what I asked, so, ma'am. Uh, you would agree, ma'am, that the main subject when you would speak to Mr. Durst that you would discuss was your need for money, correct? No, not, it's not the main conversations, no. It was a lot of my sons, no, it wasn't based on money. So, ma'am, ma listen to my question was a main part of the content of your calls. I'm not saying was that the reason for him, but was a main, main part of the content of your calls, you discussing money you needed for yourself and your family. Basically, it was to build an art studio and that he should make plans what he would like to do, to buy a place, um, buy property, and figuring that that was my source of income was the art studio. So when it closed, that's what we spoke about. What was, that was how I made an income was from the studio. So I wanted another studio and. So ma'am, please listen to my question I, again. I, I, I keep please, answering. Please listen to my question. I'm not asking you why you brought it up. I'm simply asking you, isn't it true that a large part of the content of these conversations you had with Bob Durst since he was arrested on March 14th, 2015, has been about securing money, financial assistance, property for you and members of your family? That's a yes or a no question. No, I know. I'm thinking about I am, but I want to answer it. <laughs> and no, it wasn't the basis. It wasn't, no. I mean, it was about the mortgage and if I was late on my mortgage and that, that was it. I mean, so it wasn't the whole basis. It was what I was stressed about or it, it was personal. It, I mean. Uh, Ma'am, you were asked about that very clip that I just played for you during your February 15, 2017 testimony. Do you recall that? Yes. And do you recall responding, you were asked, this is page 77, line 24, to page 78, line 4. Question, that was less, a little more than a month ago as we sit here, as we sit today, where do things stand with how much money you're supposed to be getting and when you're supposed to be getting it? And you answered, honestly, I keep telling him at another point in time, maybe, I don't know. I didn't come up with the number. Right now it wasn't, I just didn't think about it right now. Do you recall saying that? Yes. And ma'am, what you're saying is, is not that you turned down money from him or not that you told him not to give you money. You simply didn't say what the amount was and you didn't say, give it to me by this date. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Um, 
were you asked during your February 15, 2017 testimony what the number, how much money you were supposed to get? Do you recall being asked? No. This is going to be 215.17 hearing, page 78, line 22 to page 79, line 8. Question, and that number is the number of money it is going to take you to provide for your financial means for the rest of your life? And you respond, I didn't give him that number, no. Question, that's not what I asked you. The number eventually is going to be a number that will provide for your financial needs for the rest of your life, correct? Stop, objection. Oh, I, I just want to show Mr. Little my transcript. Okay. Okay. About page 78. Hold on there. Okay, so you started on 70, oh, I thought you said 79. No. So I, it's where I told you. Okay, I'm just, I thought you said page 79. No, page, okay. My bad. It's all right. Do you remember the question? Oh, I'll, no. I'll re-ask your honor. <laughs> Leave? Okay. So ma'am, yes. so you were asked, question, mm -hmm. and that number is the number of money is it going to take you to provide for your financial means for the rest of your life? Answer. I didn't give him that number, no. Question, that's not what I asked you. That number eventually is going to be a number that will provide for your financial needs for the rest of your life, correct? You answered no. Question, didn't you a moment ago concede, ma'am, that, and you respond, he offered. Question, so that number are you waiting to, to come up with? Answer, I wanted him to take care of the mortgage or he would buy the studio and that was it. Is that what your testimony was? Is that accurate? Uh, yes. So, ma'am, back even at this time, more than four years ago, you were making arrangements for Bob Durs to give you a big check to cover whatever you were going to be building. Is that right? Yes, back then, yes. Okay, would you agree yeah. that since you testified in February of 2017, you have continued to receive money from Bob Durst, either directly or through his associates, including attorneys, your attorney, et cetera. Okay, I, okay, yes, I have didn't some, see any, but okay. Have yes. some of the, these monies that you've received, have they come at your direct request? My direct, no. Ma'am, have you sent Bob Durst letters or bills discussing requesting money either directly through his attorneys or through your attorney? I, yes, I just said the mortgage payments every month, I had given that to my lawyer. That's what I gave him, I, that, that was it. So ma'am, it's your position that it's only been um, you requesting money for your mortgage, is that right? Yes, it was a, uh, four payments, three payments. It was a monthly payment. So I needed like three months, four months. Ma'am, on uh, September 20th, 2017, did you have a call with Mr. Durst where Mr. Durst mentioned $50,000 that he had given you the year prior, which you told him was gone? Oh, I don't remember. Well, is that accurate, ma'am? Does that sound accurate to you? I can go play it if you want. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say yes, and I assume it was the time I, you just played all the okay. money that went out to Hamptonburg in Orange County. During this same call, ma'am, did you tell Bob Durst that you needed another 30000 so you could buy a second car for your son, Tommy? No, no, no. $30,000, a secondhand car is like $6,000. So, no. So, ma'am, so, 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 ma so it's your testimony that on one moment it's your testimony that on September 20th 2017 you did not have a conversation with Mr. Durst where you mentioned needing thirty thousand dollars so you could buy a second car for your son Tommy no it definitely was not just a car whether it had been to something that we planned on doing other than that yeah, I don't. 
dirty it is in a car. I get four cars. <laughs> now, during that same call, do you recall Mr. Durst responding that he had lots of money in his accounts and that he was happy to give you the cash? I don't remember. But that would be a true statement, I'm sure, but I don't remember. During that same call, ma'am, did Mr. Durst mention his concern that the prosecution would say at trial that in giving you his mo this money that he was attempting to bribe you? I don't remember that either. Do, well, does that I, sound, does that sound, I, you're saying you don't remember it, does I that don't. sound consistent with the conversations that you had with Mr. Durst? Um, no, I, he's never used that word bribe or anything. I've never remembered anything like that. Did he then state to you that it really didn't matter about the bribery issue since he'd already given you $350,000 and that for that reason that the prosecution would make the bribery argument whether he gave you additional money or not? Do you recall that being said? I said it. No, I'm asking if Mr. Durst said that to you. I don't, I don't remember. I don't, the last thing. Do you recall during that same call saying to Mr. Durst, quote, I absolutely love you and there is no denying what our relationship is? Yes. What does that mean? I've, what do you mean? I, what does that mean? I'm uh, unconditionally, I, uh, I'm here for him. Like, I, I absolutely don't. love you. I that do. part I get. What's the part about there's no denying what our relationship is? What does that mean? Total, uh, our, our personalities clicked. It's, I, I don't. Your personalities don't. clicked as platonic friends? Your personalities. Yeah, we're absolutely, yes. It's somebody that you, you won't. Everybody has a, a different perception of, of what a relationship should be. Or, yes, it's platonic. I, I love him unconditionally. I mean, I could have asked for anything. I could have. And, and you did at times, correct? <laughs> no. I mean, no. So, ma'am? Taking advantage wasn't something uh, all these years, no. Ma'am? Just. When you have suggested that you and Bob Durst, when you've suggested that you buy a home together, you really meant Bob Durst buying it and the two of you living there, correct? Well, I explained the last time that I wanted, um, Bob likes to be alone, so he was going to have his own space and I was going to have my space and I was hoping that space was my studio space. And I, when he was sick in Texas, I told him back then that he was very sick and he should be with people that love him and I have a, people to take care of him, not hired help. So I suggested it a long time ago. Ma'am, I thought you testified earlier today that the subject of you and Bob Durst getting a home together never came up when he was incarcerated in Galveston, that it didn't come Did up until not. years later. It was not, has nothing to do with Galveston. It was when he, after, way after that, just to come here. Yes. No, it's okay, Your Honor. She explained. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, it, it was way after Galveston. This was the idea, not even moving, just someone that he, he was sick and wasn't around people that he should have been surrounded with. So, ma'am, I just want to, when I say together, when you were mentioning to Bob that you should buy this place together, by buying it together, you did not mean that you were going to spend any money on it. It was going to be his money, correct? Correct. So you wouldn't have actually been buying it together. He would have been buying it, and you would have been living there. Uh, I would have had a studio, but I don't know. Okay, just, I wasn't going to be there full time, and Bob didn't want to be. I was going to have an art studio. It was going to be separate. We had to draw in as two, two different stories. And I was having the studio, and this way he could be right near me. And I, that was it. What was your financial contribution going to be to this? 
excuse me what was your financial contribution going to be to this i guess it never came up he never asked me how much i was putting in well ma'am isn't it clear that what you were putting in was zero okay so i, I don't oh, no. Ma'am, so when I just asked you a moment ago what your contribution was, and you say it never came up, exactly. it came up, ma'am, let me finish. If I ask you a question and I say, ma'am, isn't it true your contribution was zero, just answer the question. Was your contribution going to be zero? Nothing. Okay, yes. Ma'am, have you or Mr. Durst ever referred to that purchased property as, quote, your love nest? Yes, he did. And it's your position that in referring it to as your love nest, that that was a platonic um, description. Is that correct? Yes. Um, SG 108 331 17 call. And your Honor, may we mark that as uh, 111 and 111A? A 211? Sorry, yes, 211. Yeah. What's the date, please? Uh, March 31st, Ma'am, it's your position that that conversation involves you and Mr. Durst engage in a platonic, non-romantic relationship? It has been, yes. And ma'am, isn't it true that during this conversation, Mr. Durst is basically telling you, hey, you know what, um, you're going to need to do that studio on your own. We'll work on the love nest when I get out. Is that correct? Well, I kept trying to interrupt him, but yes. Yeah, because you didn't like that, correct? I just... I know Mr. Durst, and I know that he wants to spend most of his time not in New York at that time, so I thought working on the studio was a better idea, and we should do it together, because it would have been definitely smarter if he's in New York for one month out of a year. So I thought that way, that yes, it should be together. Right, and But by then I would have this by myself. And right, by together, ma'am, you're putting pressure on him. You're telling him you have to promise that's going to happen, that we're going to build something right. for us because you don't have any money. Correct? Um, okay. I'm just gonna say you that. need Bob Durst to pay for your art studio because if he doesn't pay for it, you're not going to get it, correct? Then I would rent like I used to, right. So again, ma'am. So I've been renting, but. But you wanted him to buy and build you the art studio, which you wanted to combine with this platonic love nest, correct? Correct. And again, it's your, I just want to be clear for the jury. When mm -hmm. you say love nest, is that a term that you use with anybody that you are not romantically involved with? Yes, well, actually. <laughs> Yes, my kids was going to be there. He knows my chip. Well, my they're adults now, but it it's yeah, yes. So have you ever discussed, ma'am? So what you're saying is, is when you refer to a love nest, that's just another word for a house for you. Well, it's a home. A home. It's um, a difference. But, well, you know, is it a home with a romantic partner? I just finished telling you we had a platonic relationship. So, ma'am, would you agree, Forever. would you agree, ma'am, that just listening to that call and the way you refer to loveness, would you agree, even if you're saying it's not the case, that it would be a reasonable inference for somebody to conclude that you and Mr. Durst have more than a platonic relationship? Objection, Your Honor. For, 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 
opinion. What? Calls for a lay opinion. What? Yeah. No, a lay opinion is a. That's a, that's, that's, yeah, it's a funny objection. So um, it, it does seem, though, that it's, let's go sidebar. Yeah. <clears throat> Not on that, but. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Warm enough? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, the heater. I, this more early this morning was next door in the next courtroom. It was really, really hot, and it seems to be making its way over here. So it's really awful now. I hope they fix it uh, tonight. We don't have that much uh, farther to, to go. But uh, anyway, um, thanks for your patience. We uh, talked about this a little bit, and uh, you may continue now. Thank you, Mr. Honor. Lewin. Ma'am, so yeah. I understand that you are saying that when you were using the word love nest, that to you, that meant platonic. But what I'm asking you is a different question. I'm asking you, ma'am, would you agree that the way that you and Mr. Durst refer to the love nest and to how you love each other, that it would be a reasonable interpretation for somebody listening to that to believe that, you know what, they're more than friends. Yes, people could interpret it how they want. <laughs> and ma'am, do you speak that way to any of your other friends? Um, I don't have any other male friends. I don't. Um, over the years and since his arrest in 2015, has Mr. Durst discussed with you the idea of you testifying as a witness for him at trial? No. He's never discussed you testifying as a character witness for him? I can't recall that. So you're not saying that it didn't happen, you're just saying you don't remember? Right, I don't remember right. that. Um, I want to talk about Nick Chabin for a moment. How long have you and Nick known each other? Uh, since 1987. And would you agree that in terms of Bob Durst and Nick Chabin, that Nick Chabin and Bob Durst were extremely close? Yes, at one point, yes. And in fact, you testified to that during the February 15, 2017 hearing, is that correct? Yes. You were asked if they were mutually very close friends and you responded they were, is that right? Yes. Who are Stuart and Emily Altman? They are friends, uh, Bob. And you know both Stuart and Emily. Stuart goes back to high school for Bob, is that right? Yes. Would you describe, from what you know of it, Stuart and Emily Altman's relationship with Bob Durst as the relationship of Bob Durst and an attorney and his secretary, or a relationship of Bob Durst and his high school friend and his wife? I, I don't know, honestly. Be, I've never been in that circle to see their interaction, I am very rarely. Right. SG 048, April 18, 2015 interview, page 22, lines 17 through 27. Mr. Milius. That was your voice, right? Yes, yes. I don't know, like I said, on a professional level. I just knew that he said he knew Stuart 
from years ago, but I've never um, socially been in their company uh, as a social, so I don't know what his relationship really. You would I don't agree know how often he speaks to them or. Oh. You would agree, ma'am, that the answer to the question I asked you would have been, as you said, on April 18, 2015. I don't yeah. think he ever. I was hesitant. Ma'am, you've got to let me finish. Okay. Just, all right. You agree that the answer would have been, as you said, on April, 15, April 18, 2015, I don't think he ever used him as his lawyer. I don't think he did. Correct? Correct. I don't know. Uh, so. Who are Andrew Jarecki and Mark Smerling? Uh, directors. And you actually have sat down on two different occasions and voluntarily give them interviews, is that correct? Yes. And in fact, you said that you've spoken to them many times, is that correct? Andrew, <clears throat> I have. How many times do you think you've spoken to Andrew? A lot. Andrew called me a lot. <laughs> Prior to meeting them, were you aware of the movie All Good Things? No. Did you end up seeing the movie at some point after you met them? Yes. And you are aware that Mr. Durst has seen the movie as well, correct? Yes. And you and Mr. Durst have discussed that movie, is that right? Yes. And what did he tell you about the movie? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember. Admission. I just don't remember what. Okay, SG026. I mean, you must have liked it. And, Your Honor, can we mark this as uh, 213 and 213A? Yes. Pardon? 310.14. Ma'am, I'm going to try to skip ahead. Do you recall saying to Mr. Jarecki about Bob Durst and all good things, quote, but he really did, Bob really did tell me he enjoyed the movie? Yes. And that's correct. That's accurate. Is that right? I wasn't, I wasn't going to tell Andrew Jarecki he didn't. But no, I, he, he did say some parts were very good. Or well, something to that line. I don't exactly remember. Well, Ma'am, did Bob Durst ever say to you, you know what, I don't like all good things because it portrays me as having murdered personally or been responsible for the deaths no. of three. Ma'am, you've got to let me finish my question. Uh, okay, well, well. <clears throat> let me uh, instruct the witness. All right. So rather than have Mr. Moon yell at you, to, I'm going to ask you to Keep in mind that you're being asked a question. Mr. Loon will take his time asking that question. Wait till you're sure he's done. Okay? Take a breath. Wait for any objections. Then give your uh, answer. Okay? Answer only the question. All right? Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Just for the record, yes. uh, continuing the objection, even though the court talked about the order being the, within the court's discretion. Yes. Just Perhaps. You may not make this argument in front of the jury. No, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. All right, ma'am. Yes. Did Mr. Durst ever say to you about the movie All Good Things? You know what? They portray me as either personally or indirectly responsible for three murders and the killing of at least one dog. I do not like the movie. Did he ever say that to you? No. In fact, man, would you agree that the one thing that Mr. Durst has said to you that he was upset about the movie was that it portrayed him as killing a dog, which he didn't do, correct? I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember, honestly. You don't remember your, is it fair to call Bob your soulmate? Is that a fair? I believe he's soulmates, I think we're just, is that a fair characterization? No, I, I, no, because then that would mean something else. So, just do soulmates get love nests together it, or no? No, that's what I'm saying. You would it open up? No, just soulmate. Next no question. No. Okay, no, just, let, let, let me ask this, ma'am. Do you think that you would remember that Bob Durst was upset about the movie All Good Things? 
The part that bothered him was that it alleged that he killed a dog. Is that something you recall? I, I really, I, no, I don't remember. I don't remember. Ma'am, you watched the jinx, correct? Um, not all of it. Sorry, I didn't. So ma'am, you, do you recall the scene in the jinx, ma'am, where Mr. Durst interrupts the filming to say, quote, now, Andrew, that I do not like, the idea that I could do something to Igor. Do you remember that? No, I, 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 only, I seen three episodes. I didn't see the whole thing, and I don't remember. So your best friend in the world is a subject of a six-part miniseries, <laughs> and then is charged with murder, and you're telling me, I, I might have seen part of it. Is that right? Is that what you're telling the jury? Yes. Um, let's talk for a moment about the Giordano boxes. You know what I mean by those, correct? Yes. Um, those were 64 boxes of Bob Durst material. It's foundational? Overall? Ma'am, those were 64 boxes of Mr. Durst materials that were stored in your basement. Is that correct? Yes. And these were materials that Mr. Durst had arranged to have sent to you. Is that correct? Yes. And these were materials that you voluntarily turned over to New York State Police Detective Joe Becerra on March 15, 2015. Is that right? Yes. And these boxes you had had in your possession approximately five to six years. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Ma'am, your original instructions from Mr. Durst were to go through the boxes for him to see what he should keep and what he should get rid of. Is that correct? Yes. And in fact, it turned out that there were materials in there, confidential communications with his lawyers and financial documents, all kinds of materials. Is that right? I didn't look through the boxes. I only seen um, family, his father's paper, name and things. And it, there were things in there I know I wouldn't know what was good and what wasn't good. So I didn't look through the boxes. Ma'am, you later became aware that those types of materials that I just mentioned were in those boxes, correct? Well, you just said it. I, I don't, like I said, I didn't personally see anything. I don't. Because that's not my question. Listen to my question carefully. You became aware at a certain point in time, ma'am, that inside those 64 boxes contained things like confidential communications that Mr. Durst had had with his attorneys, confidential financial documents, a document called the BD story. You're aware. You oh, is that yes. correct? Now. Mr. Durst later told you to let Andrew Jarecki and his people go through all the boxes and to take whatever he wanted, correct? Yes. And at the time, you thought that was a bad idea, right? Yes. You actually tried to discourage Mr. Durst from letting uh, Andrew Jarecki and his people look through the boxes. Is that right? Yes. You even said to Mr. Durst, quote, you don't even know Andrew and you don't know what's in the boxes, correct? Correct. You even tried to stall when Andrew and his people came over, telling them to, quote, give me a month and let me see if Bob feels the same way, correct? That's what you told him, right? I think they were looking for a DVD. I told them, give me a chance to look for the DVD. They wanted a DVD, and I said, give me a chance. You, you finally had to have a conversation with Mr. Durst where he just told you, quote, just give him what he wants, period. Yes. By the way, when Mr. Durst speaks like that, have you heard him when he wants something done, he will say at the end of it, period. Is that correct? Correct. Mr. Durst, when he has a strong opinion, he's pretty definitive in what he wants. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And 
when he told you that give him whatever he wants, period, did that mean to you that at that point in time, any further debate or argument with Mr. Durst was worthless, wouldn't change anything? Correct. So you agreed and let them go through the materials, is that right? Yes. Now, it turned out that you later became aware that there were some very damaging documents in those boxes, correct? No. Um, no. Overruled on those grounds, but <clears throat> I think it's but, but Your Honor, can't, <laughs> Your Honor can't, Mr. can't Mr. Chesnoff make his own objections without help from the court? He misses one, and the court will say, hey, well, here's another no, one. Don't do that. Just... Stop, stop <laughs> arguing that way. <clears throat> so you're on the court will overrule his objection, yes, correct? No, I, I, I sustain that one. What, on hearsay. which objection was sustained, Your Honor? No, it's not hearsay. It's rel irrelevant also. Relevant. <laughs> okay. okay. Ma'am? Yeah. So are you aware, have you striked it? Have you had conversations with Mr. Durst about the boxes and Andrew taking possession of them? No. You've never had a conversation with Mr. Durst since that time about Andrew Jarecki and these boxes? The last time we spoke about Andrew Jarecki, I said I was upset that they were at the house for nine hours and made themselves very much at home. Right. In, in fact, you told Mr. Durst on April 18, 2015, that um, they were there for about 12 hours going through the boxes, correct? Yes, it might have been close. To and then you later, you took a picture yes. of them going through the boxes to send to Bob Durst in jail. Is that right? I don't, he wasn't in jail. I emailed him. You, you, he was in custody when you emailed him. Is that correct? You sent him, you got him the picture that you took. You got that to him where he was in custody. Is that right? No. Because after I did it, I emailed it, and I said, they're still here. So I emailed it to him. Did you have a discussion with Mr. Durst about that on May 25th, 2015? I don't remember. I just remember emailing. I don't remember. Ma'am, isn't it true that the boxes, strike that, isn't it true that Mr. Jarecki and Mr. Smurling, do you remember when it was they, they went through the boxes? No. I would have to look through emails. I don't remember. You agree, ma'am, it was well before. 2015 when Mr. Durst was arrested, correct? Yes. Ma'am, I, I want to play SG 070 May 25th, 2015. This is two months after Mr. Durst was arrested. This is going to be 525-15, uh, 15-17 jail call. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you remember, I took a picture and I emailed it to you when they were all here working and I left them in the backyard. I remember. So ma'am, you said you never talked to Mr. Durst about the Giordano boxes, but this is more than two months after you turned the Giordano boxes over to investigator Becerra. And you're having a conversation about those boxes, correct? I, I yes, it wasn't a probably a short statement. I don't know what the content of it was, but we never spoke about, like, had a whole conversation about this. Ma'am, isn't it true that you were trying to justify to Mr. Durst that, in essence, hey Bob, it wasn't my idea to let Jarecki and Smerling go through the boxes. You're the one who told me to let them do it. Is that a fair synopsis of different conversations you've had with Mr. Durst? I don't recall that. Well, is it true, ma'am, that 
you did not want Mr. Durst to blame you for any negative consequences that occurred. No. Ma'am, you got to let me finish my I'm question. I'm sorry, I thought that was it. Like, no, I was in the middle okay. of it. Let me ask again. All right. Ma'am, isn't it true that you did not want Mr. Durst to blame you for any negative consequences that were the result of Jarecki and Smirling going through the boxes? No. On March 15, 2015, did you sign a consent form allowing Investigator Becerra to seize and transport those boxes from your basement? Yes. And in fact, when you were interviewed the next day by Investigator Becerra, you said again that you had no problem with them removing the boxes. Is that correct? Correct. I said, I don't own them, so I can't give you something I don't own. Ma'am, were you in contact with Mr. Durst after he fled Houston after episode five of the Jinx on March 8th, 2015? And just to make it easy for you, he's arrested on March 14th, 2015, the Saturday, which is the Sunday before the finale. So I'm asking you about episode five, which aired on Sunday, March 8th. He's going to be arrested on the 14th, which is six days later. So I'm asking you, were you in contact with him after he fled Houston before he was arrested? Yes. And can you please describe how were you in contact with him and what was the extent of that contact? Let's see. Told me that he was coming up to New York um, and that he was going to be driving. Did he tell you at any time that he was, during this, the, this week, that he was going to be fleeing, that he was on the run? No. SG 097-315-2015, interview with Jarecki and Smirling. And Your Honor, may this be marked as 215, 215A? Yes. Isn't it true that you told Andrew Jarecki that Bob Durst told you that, in essence, things were going bad and he had to get away? Yes, I didn't consider it fleeing. I just thought he was coming to New York, but, and he was jumping to conclusions. So he was not really fleeing if you're coming back to New York. I didn't. Ma'am, so yes. when he said, when you said to him, everything's going to go bad, you didn't take that as meaning he was fleeing? No, I just thought he was jumping to conclusions. Well, ma'am, you had watched uh, episode five of The Jinx, correct? Uh, I did see parts of it. I well, ma'am, you knew when you were talking to Mr. Durst that in episode five, that was when he had been confronted with the cadaver note and the serum note, correct? Mm, right. Ma'am, you agree that back at that time, Mr. Durst was completely denying authorship of the cadaver note, correct? Correct. And you were aware of that, correct? Yes. And mm -hmm. when you saw episode five and you saw him being confronted with these two notes that looked the same, which he's now actually admitted that he wrote, mm -hmm. You realize, ma'am, that that was a problem for Mr. Durst, correct? Uh, I can't. Um, 
Did I, I, I can't say, I am, um, no. You did not realize that was a problem? No. So, when you just gave that statement, where you're quoting him as saying, I have to leave because this is, you know, it's going to be, everything's going to go bad. And I said to him that he was jumping to conclusions that the case was opened a long time ago. Ma'am, what else could the reasonable interpretation be of that exchange other than Bob Durst is telling you he's in big trouble and you're trying to reassure him, well, it's not that bad. I thought it, I thought it was going to look bad. I, I can't tell you. Did he tell you where he was going? He was coming to New York. Did you know that he was going to New Orleans? He was driving, so I, he was stopped and called me in New Orleans, and I told him just to keep driving. Ma'am, he told you he was in New Orleans, correct? Yeah, yes. In fact, ma'am, you talked to him earlier on the same day he was arrested, correct? I don't remember if it was the day before or the day. I'm not exactly sure, but I spoke to him right before, when he was in New Orleans. And when he called you, you're on. This would be. I'm going to go to a new area. This would be a very good place to stop if it works for the court. I know it's five minutes oh, early. I, can't, I, can't. I agree. <laughs> Oh, no. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to order you to return to this court tomorrow. Oh, do not God. discuss, and that will be at 9 o'clock, do not discuss your testimony with any other witness in this case. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject I'm connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. See you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Oh, my gosh. I have a problem. You can you wait here for a moment? Oh my God. Just, 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 I can't, just wait. Okay, you're ordered to return tomorrow. You need, need to know how I can get my medication. I didn't bring my medication, and I'm never going to be. I'm sorry, I, I, uh... <laughs> Is your lawyer driving you? No, he's got to go. There's a case tomorrow. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, you're, you're excused until tomorrow, order to return. Are we excused from going on? I think, pardon me? Nine o'clock? Nine o'clock for everyone? Uh, any other, um, I don't know if anyone wanted to, if there are any issues, I'm no. ready to excuse you. No, you wouldn't. I think the defense might, but that's okay. I think I, I heard them out. All right, uh, juror number 11 indeed changed her appointment to August 10 to coincide wow. with the day we're already dark. So we won't lose that day. So thank you for suggesting it and our thanks to her. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, uh, then Department 1 is adjourned. I did it earlier, but now you've you've realized what you want to say. Go well, ahead. No, because it, it, Go ahead. On the record, a couple of hours, there's been no effort to provide substantive testimony that is the subject of impeachment. There have been no prior inconsistent statements. She has testified consistently with her multiple interviews with law enforcement. Her prior testimony in front of you, Your Honor, with an occasional memory lapse when refreshed, she acknowledges this is only an effort to impeach her in front of the jury. It's the same thing that has been done multiple times now by Mr. Lewin with witnesses, where he brings them in most respectfully just to beat them up in front of the jury, to suggest there's something nefarious between Mr. Durst and the witness, that their motives for, for what action I don't know yet, other than to suggest that uh, some pecuniary interest 
But for what for what end? I, I guess. I mean, I, I, at some I, point he has to do something. Right? Yeah, I think he missed some of it because I, I think he's, that's what's been happening uh, in the at the last half hour. I mean, I, I heard uh, I heard an, a description of an adoptive admission. I heard a. A description of the the source of, of boxes that I know are going to be the source of a, a story. But she's I, not denying it. So why do you impeach her? Well, 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 well wait, wait a second. The the, the, the witness is, is testifying to facts. The jury is the judge of whether or not she's being truthful in the way she's describing this, the way she may be shading it. So it's all subject to impeachment. There is a nugget of argument, though, that I I, I do want to address that I, I think is legitimate, and that is. Here, here's my concern. I mean, I've been waiting for you and not hearing objection on, on, on points and you're raising, and it has to be contemporaneous, but, but there have been times where there is a failure to recollect and the, the, the proper procedure would be then to refresh the recollection. If the re recollection is not refreshed, then the, uh, the, the statement may be read for that purpose or Possibly, it's a it's a feigned lack of memory. I don't think that's the case. Now, eventually, we may end up with the inconsistent statement. Anyway, I, I figure that's what's going on, so I'm not intervening. But but there are some of these statements that are not actually inconsistent with what the witness has just said. But absent an objection, I figure, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna help you because we're gonna get there anyway because we're gonna get there anyway. So it's more efficient for me to just let it go. Okay, except your honor, with all due respect, to some degree, I'm afraid to object because I believe that my objections on relevance and hearsay have been valid. The courts overruled me. I don't want to look like the lawyer that objects to everything in front of the jury to be consistently. Overruled. Well, you're making the wrong objection sometimes, I would say, and other times you're, I don't agree with you. I mean, the, the hearsay ones are, are either his admissions or they're clearly for state of mind. There hasn't been a, a well, good how was, how was Jarecki's statements to her, not hearsay? That's, uh, Jarecki's statements are to her are, not offered, are clearly not offered for the truth. So, so it's, it's all, it's all uh, just a statement of a person out of court. It's not hearsay, it's an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Unless it meets each part of that, each element of that, I'm not going to sustain your objection. So I'm sorry that, uh, you're, that the objections you're making are not, are not resonating, but unless you do object to a, to a, a legitimately problematic question, and, and I even, and, and Mr. Lewin uh, complained that I'm, I'm supplying the, the grounds for you, and at some point I do intervene to prevent um, something that I think is not not appropriate, but but that's where we stand. Uh, and you know, I'm just letting you know that that, uh, that 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 so far any motion to strike is is uh, denied. There's kind of clearly substantive evidence that's come in, and I think more is coming. Now. Yeah, what I'm confused about, Your Honor, is this: she is answering the questions truthfully. That's that, something okay. That, 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 that is okay. Whether a question is truthful. Or not is that's for the jury to answer. Okay, but the, the question is if it is inconsistent, if it is not the same thing that she said previously, she may she may be confronted with that previous statement, so she may deny or explain it. But he says, isn't it true that the last time you were here you said this? That's that's not asking that after she denies an answer. It's so, starting the question. With the presumption that she's not answering it, Your Honor. And also, there's been there have been prior consistent statements introduced. So she not only did she say it now, but she said it when she testified previously, and that's that's also acceptable. So I, I have to judge it in the in the moment. It has to be a contemporaneous objection. But I'm just giving you a framework for how it ought to work and how it hasn't worked with this witness from from your perspective. But I, I don't know how, what to tell you. And, and, and I'm still confused, Your Honor. I apologize because I try not to be dense. But how is it relevant evidence if the questions are, did you deliver the box? Yes, I did. That's relevant. How do you get to start impeaching her if she tells you I delivered the box? That's well, what we just heard. I, we heard a little bit more than that. Uh, Mr. Lewin, you want to, you, need, you feel the need to make the record clearer? No, the only thing I would say is just simply this. Um, it's my approach, which the court understands within its discretion, to when I'm going to put up a witness that I think, and by the way, 
she's come in as Mr. Oliver has before and I believe lied. So it's not that I don't have, and the court doesn't have a record of what she said before. So what I choose to do, which as the court accurately pointed out, is my option. I like to diminish their credibility on the issues before I start asking them the specific question that's going to be relevant. I'm absolutely allowed to do that. As the court pointed out, I don't know if it's off the record or in court, in my opinion, in my experience has been that it's a more effective way of doing things because the jury is able to understand where the witness is coming from, who they are, what their biases are, before they start presenting what they're going to present. Now, as an offer of proof, counsel already knows they have the transcript from the last hearing. Now, where we're at right now, it's very similar to Doug Oliver. I start with this stuff, and now I'm hitting with the substance. Do you know the next area that she's going to be hit with? The fact that she sent him $115,000 in a suitcase and then said she had no knowledge that it was there. Um, the fact that she is saying she didn't know Mr. Durst was fleeing. So I have many things to hit her with, and I'm very confident, as the court's aware, Your Honor, you know, I do my homework. I don't offer things that I can't support, and I know the evidence code pretty thoroughly. So I appreciate that the court is allowing me to do my job and that I'm doing that is in the way that it needs to be handled. Uh, that's all that I really have to say about it. And, and Mr. Chestnut, I, I do think that you're, you're understating the, the, the significance of, of, the, of the substance of, of this, not just the impeachment. I think this is so irrelevant and, and significant. Which part, Your Honor? No, I'm, I'm finding the, the, the part about the, the her, what she's presenting with, first, the, def the defendant's statements to her, and also the the idea of uh, this money that she's uh, she's taking large amounts of money and, and she shipped him money, and it was a bowling ball case or something. I mean, yeah, what, what, what the question is this, yeah. Your Honor? If there's no nefarious purpose for sending the money, then why do you have to impeach it? I, I think it is nefarious, Miss, Mr. Chestnut. They, it's they, very they nefarious. They, they can't establish she had knowledge, Your Honor. Well. So what, it, it's all a bootstrap, Your Honor, as far as I'm concerned. I may be wrong, but you give me a chance to make my record. I appreciate it. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Department 1 is adjourned.